There we go. Um, okay, uh, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Charles Littnan. Um, I am the president of the Society for Marine Mammalogy and um, just wanted to uh, start out uh, by welcoming everyone to this conversation and um, send out my hopes that you're all doing um, well or as well as can be during a very tumultuous um, 2020 and that you and your loved ones are safe. Um, part of this upheaval beyond the pandemic this year um, has been a lot of the intense conversations and protests and uh, debates related to social justice issues and um, equitability and opportunity um, that have been at dinner tables, in individual labs, um, across social media and spilling into the streets and in protests worldwide. Um, and with all of these pressures and all of these uh, stressors, 2020 is a time for potential introspection for those willing to do so and for change and for growth. And I think a lot of us, and probably many people on this panel, we're doing that at a profoundly personal level um, during 2020. Um, but there's an opportunity for us as a professional society, as the Society for Marine Mammalogy, to stop and to take stock of how we do our work, um, how we can hold it up to the light and determine if there might be a better way for us to accomplish our mission as it relates to marine mammal science and conservation. Um, the petition on unpaid internships that we received in July uh, was an opportunity to do just that. And I'm not gonna go into details of the petition. It is uh, available online on our website, um, as well as maybe somebody can share um, the link in the chat um, coming up. But um, the petition was worried about um, unpaid internships and their impact to access for, for a large cohort of, of aspiring marine mammal scientists. And it asked for action. And we thought it was important to start today to highlight how seriously we took this petition and some of the, the actions that have been taken to date and more that will come. Um, we cannot, as a society of marine mammalogy, um, radically change the world. And it's not from a lack of will and it's not or desire, it's just due to our relatively um, narrow span of influence globally. Um, but we can commit and we have committed to changing the way that we do our work um, and in our own small way, hopefully making uh, the world a slightly better place. Um, I'm, I wanna say I'm intensely proud of the board um, and the seriousness with, with which they took this topic and, and they treat every topic very seriously. They're amazing people, um, but especially topics that involve the welfare and development of our early career scientists. So uh, again, without going into great detail, these are on our webpage and, and will be coming out for a vote soon for you, those of you on this that are members. Um, the first steps by our diversity and inclusion committee and ethics committee was to review our code of ethics, these best practices, the, these, these expectations we have that our membership will follow, to add language that promoted the entry of disadvantaged and underrepresented, indiv underrepresented individuals into our marine mammal science world. Um, and also where possible, a best practice of fairly compensating all individuals involved in ongoing and planned research efforts. And those were the places to start. Doug Wartsock and our Committee for Scientific Advisors um, took that language and, and made it real by going in and reviewing our small grants and aid of research uh, grants. It's um, a pot of money we put out each year to assist research around the world. And historically, we have not allowed stipends through those awards. Um, through their review and a lot of discussion on the board, uh, we've upped that. We are now allowing for 25% of, of every grant to be targeted towards stipends with a commitment to reviewing this policy in the near future to see if that should be expanded um, to, to a greater amount. So these are small, but they're important steps. I think it's important to know that there are longer term things that we are trying to address, including all committees where appropriate, reviewing their policies to ensure that we don't have things in place that are inadvertently blocking opportunity for people joining um, this field of research in our society. Um, so it is a time for change for us. Um, while our impact may not be large, one of the greatest responsibilities we have, and we wrote this in, in the lead up to this, to this meeting is, we do have, I think, a responsibility to engage in conversations and to educate our community. 
Um, and I hope that this is a first of a series of di difficult conversations, of hard and challenging conversations, not just about equitability and opportunity issues, but about other challenging topics our society is facing in marine mammal science and conservation. Um, I've been a member for this, of the society for about maybe a little less than 30 years. A large chunk of that time I've been on the board. And I think it's safe to say that generally the SMM has been reluctant to engage in, in, in some thorny issues. Um, and a lot of that has to do with just the diversity of our society. Um, so many cultures that, that are under our tent and um, the various value systems that, that operate in, in different cultures. And so um, it's, it's always shied away or not always, but often shied away from those harder conversations. I think in the long run that does not serve us as a community um, that by not challenging ourselves to grow and to tackle these things, um, our growth stops, um, our evolution halts, and I believe we would move into an area where we would be less relevant and our influence would wane. And so I do hope that in the future we can have more of these hard conversations um, in between conferences, at conferences, um, and learn to how to have a productive dialogue about these things. Um, so it's exciting times and, and I'm very curious to see how this goes. And so I'll stop speaking in just one moment. Um, on that note, I, I want to take a moment to reflect on some things initially in this dialogue uh, when the petition first came out and, and there was a, a slurry of emails and, and online discussions. A couple of things that, that worried me or, or disappointed me to a degree. And the first was, and the most important one is, there were a lot of stories being shared by people. Um, some were incredible and, and, and very, very brave. Um, but a lot of them were anonymous or started with a phrase from our early career scientists that said, I'm not sure if it's appropriate or if I'm allowed to share my story. Um, and my first reaction, and I hope the reaction to many is, is what sort of climate do we have, whether it is in an individual lab or uh, the society as a whole, that um, people are concerned um, to share their perspectives on these items. And I have to admit, um, that some of the responses that came from senior scientists answered that question uh, for me to, to some small degree. Not all of them, there were a lot of, there's a lot of amazing discussions that have happened. Um, but I know that the perception of some of the comments from esteemed leaders in our field were felt to be dismissive, condescending, intransigent, stifling, chilling to some. So I guess I just, in this limited role I have for a short period of time, I, I, I want to say to the young scientists for the future that are going to get into these conversations, your critical questioning voice and your experiences are absolutely essential to moving this dialogue forward. And so if in doubt, um, err towards the side of the petitioners, be vocal, raise questions, push issues. Um, and I ask our scientific leaders, I, myself included, and there are a huge swath of just amazing people, um, just to remember our obligation to engage as mentors. Um, and yeah, we need to cha challenge ideas and, and we need to make people think or help them think, but to grow and not to crush. Um, I think we can do better. I think this in initial dialogue could have been handled better. And I hope that's one thing that comes out of these future difficult discussions is just a, a greater ability to be open to these things and not quite so defensive. Um, so before I hand this over to um, the esteemed Dr. Archer, um, in the committee, I just want to give my great gratitude to the petitioners, to everyone that has engaged in this dialogue to date, um, to all of you that have showed up today. It's an amazing turnout of over 200 people. I don't know how many on Facebook. Um, to the good people on this panel who are willing to share their perspectives. Um, and of course, to Katerina Audley and, and Lindsay Porter who helped make all of this happen. And one last thing, tonight is not about finding the answer. Um, it's about getting insight from different sides on a very complicated issue and hearing some different perspectives from just a few of the different corners of our global community, not all of them. And I hope that we can find steps after this to, to get those voices in as well. So I just ask um, that we all listen with an open mind and speak with kindness and humility. And without further ado, thank you for um, uh, letting me prattle on. And I hand this over to Eric in the panel and um, be well, everyone. Aloha. Uh, thank you, um, Charles. Um, 
Ariel, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see the slide? Great, thanks. Um, so just, uh, I wanna also echo Charles's uh, welcome to everybody here. Um, we've got, a, a, I think, a good night set up and uh, looking forward to some of the discussions. Um, we have uh, four um, very uh, interesting and, and I think um, uh, on point uh, panelists today. And we'll be hearing from each one of them in turn and they're bringing a different perspective to this discussion. And, um, and then we will turn over the discussion to uh, the attendees. Um, we have several ways that we can, um, we're, we're taking questions and comments. Uh, there's the Zoom chat. And uh, I guess, you know, like most Zoom meetings, there'll be um, offline or, or side discussions and questions that go on through the chat. But uh, feel free to um, also use that for uh, Q&A. We're gonna hold questions until we're done with all of the um, presentations and then we'll have just one large um, uh, Q&A session, but feel free to enter questions or comments anytime during the session. Um, if you have a question for a particular panelist or person, um, uh, please uh, note that in the chat directly. Uh, otherwise, um, we'll just see what panelists um, are interested in, in addressing them. We also have a uh, sort of anonymous um, box uh, through Google Forms. I'll post the um, the link periodically uh, into the chat box and you can ask questions there. And then this is also being streamed on Facebook Live. So if you're um, following us there, you can uh, post questions there. Uh, through the, all of these different uh, outlets, we've got, um, it's, it, we've got several people monitoring each one. So um, be patient with us. It's sort of like a game of whack-a-mole. I'm, I'm dealing with about four different screens here. And so I'm not uh, ignoring it. I'm just uh, yeah, paying attention to different things at the same time. Um, so we're, uh, so uh, pose your questions, your comments, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try to address them throughout the, the night. Um, let's see. There. Uh, just a few, going over a few you know, ground rules. We wanna make sure that you know, we have a, a, a good discussion and, 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 and come away uh, with um, in a new information. And, and I think there's, I think, you know, four basic things that we should all just try to keep in mind. Um, you know, this, just to trust that we're, we're all here for the common good. We're all very interested um, both in, in our science and, and in the people around us. We're, um, you know, many of us are, are, are close friends. All of us are colleagues. So uh, we're, we, we've got, um, very, a lot in common and, and we're all trying to, to navigate this as best as we can. And then following that, um, just keep in mind to, you know, we want to respect everybody's um, experiences and, and individual input in this. We've, um, we, we wanted to have this forum in order to hear from more voices and, and to, uh, to get uh, these shared experiences out on the table. Um, and, and what we're here to do primarily is, is to listen. As Charles said, we're not here to try to, we don't expect to solve any of the problems. Um, but uh, I, th I think the forum like this is, is useful for understanding um, more than trying to make yourself understood. So it, it's, uh, it, it's worthwhile to try to take in um, everybody's uh, input and, and opinion and, and, and try to um, you know, come away with uh, new ideas and a new frame of mind. And then finally, uh, participate. Um, we, we, as I said, we've got multiple uh, uh, ways that, that you'll be able to, uh, to comment and question, um, but you know, we, we want to keep that open for everybody. So you know, try not to um, monopolize that space. Um, it's important to you know, recognize that, that we're, we're discussing ideas and we want to keep um, uh, you know, this uh, on, a, on an objective rather than subjective, non-personal basis. So question the ideas, not, not the individuals. Um, 
but but make the comment make comments that that you're interested in in order to share your perspective um uh rather than trying to persuade that is what we're having is more of a discussion it's not a debate and then finally um you know, we, we we want to avoid um assumptions that we might have or or laying blame or speculating you know speak from your honest opinion and from your honest perspective and i, I think we'll all come out uh the better for it um let's we have three panelists. Um, I'll be introducing each one, and and uh, their um, you know, short bios were on the invitation. I'm really looking forward to, to hearing from all of them because I think they represent um, many sides of this this conversation. And then finally, I just want to echo uh, Charles's uh, thanks to some of the people that have been very influential in in making this happen and and putting this on, uh, Katerina Audley, who's been uh, the whiz for, uh, for, for getting the, the, the tech working and, and keeping us all in line. Lindsay Porter, who has been invaluable for making sure that we have some, uh, some fresh perspectives and voices on this. And then finally, the, the SNM Board of Governors for supporting the work. And in general, if there's, um, you know, any other comments, or if you want to um, continue this conversation with us, please feel free to email either Charles or myself or, and my co-chair on the diversity committee. And our emails are on the slide there and also on the website. Um, I guess with that, oh, and uh, this want to say we have uh, allotted an hour and a half for this. And so we um, have now eaten up about 15 minutes of that. As we come out of the panelists and go to the Q&A, that will be you know, relatively free form. But as the time winds down, uh, I will um, try to close it out. Uh, however, if, and, and, and then you know, wave goodbye to people because we recognize that there are people from multiple time zones around the world and some on the wrong side of the clock here. So we don't want to keep people up too late. Um, but if there's a um, you know, spirited discussion going on, um, we, we may be able to just continue that. But there will be a, a uh, we're trying to respect the time as we, we get near to the, the end. So with that, I will stop sharing. And then I think go to Ariel. And want to thank Ariel for uh, agreeing to, to join us. She um, is director of the Forbes Biological Station and an assistant research scientist. Um, and she's going to, uh, to give us a short over or an overview of um, a talk that she's given before that I think is, is very, uh, is obviously relevant to this discussion. And it's nice to have a perspective from uh, outside of the field. So Ariel, please feel free. Thank you so much, Eric. And thank you everyone for, for coming to listen tonight and to, to consider all these different ideas. Um, the talk I'm gonna give is one that I gave at the Wilson Ornithological Society Conference last year. I'm not a marine mammal person. And so I'm gonna give this from the ornithological perspective because one, I, I wanna stay in my lane as an ornithologist, but also this is not an issue that is unique to marine mammal science um, by a long shot. And I also wanna acknowledge my co-authors Angus, Alex, and Margaret, who have been really integral parts of this work. And of course, now my slides won't move forward. All right, so um, brief statement to start that I'm going to assume that we can all agree that a more diverse ornithological workforce is good for birds, it's good for ornithology, it's good for everyone who cares about birds, you know, replace with marine mammals where you find appropriate. Um, we're not going to get into why that is, that's not the point of today, but I just want to say that's an assumption I'm going into this talk with. And so when we're talking about unpaid, underpaid, and pay to work jobs, um, the, the kind of story that's often told along with these is that, well, if, you, you know, if you're really dedicated, then you'll be willing to go out and work without pay and get your foot in the door, and that will lead to these 
these longer term benefits. And it show, it's, it's, it's a way of showing how dedicated you are to the science, right? But the, the problem is that many, many people do not have the financial resources to not have income coming in because they still have expenses, right? Like, you know, we all have different things we have to pay for regardless of, you know, kind of where we are in the world and what we're doing. And we also know that, you know, throughout our global society, financial resources are not equally available to all people, you know, whether across racial or ethnic lines, disability status, membership in the LGBTQ plus community, gender, there are a lot of different reasons that not everybody has the same financial resources. And so when we say that you're proving your dedication to science by being willing to work unpaid, what we're really saying is that you're proving that you have financial resources. Because I personally don't think that people that have financial resources are actually more dedicated. Um, just as across many other different demographic um, characteristics, we know that scientific um, interest is, is not you know, restricted to a certain demographic group. I don't think the dedication is either. And I also think it's really important in these conversations to uh, you know, really be cognizant of this concept of survival bias. Um, we can't just go to our award-winning senior members of our societies, ask them how they got here, and then track our roadmap after theirs. We need to determine why their peers aren't with us anymore. Um, and the way that I often illustrate this is, is this figure here from World War II where the planes were coming back and the mechanics were recording where the bullet holes were on the plane to try and figure out where to put the armor on. And at, at one point, Abraham Wald actually pointed out that you don't need to put more armor on the plane where the bullet holes are because those planes made it back. We need to be putting armor on the plane on these places where there aren't any bullet holes because that's where the planes that were shot that didn't come back were shot, right? It, those are the weaknesses. Those are the places we need to understand the story of those planes that didn't make it back. We need to understand the stories of our colleagues, you know, that are of, of our colleagues who have left our respective um, career paths and, and understand why that was, which is not to say that every person who starts on a career path has to stay on it their whole career, but what are the reasons that people choose a different path and how can we you know, remove the barriers that prevented them from going along the path that they were interested in. And so in 2015, my colleagues Alex Bond and I did an opinion piece for the Wildlife Society Bulletin um, about unpaid labor in wildlife ecology. And we went through a bunch of the different job boards um, that are relevant to wildlife ecology here in North America. And we found that unpaid jobs are relatively common. Roughly one in three of them was unpaid. Um, and I, I think it's also important to point out that there are many pieces to this that aren't just related to the actual receiving of payment. Um, you know, here in the US and, and, in, and in many places, if you're not an employee, you don't have any workplace protections. So you're not, you're not protected for your physical safety, you're not protected from sexual and physical harassment. If you're hurt on the job, you don't have access to things like workers comp, which can then become like a real kind of um, spiral of financial ruin. And so, um, you know, it's, it's not just the lack of income coming in, but it can also be that unpaid positions can, and I'm not saying that all of them are, but they can be a way where folks can be exposed to a lot more danger than is really necessary. Um, and there are often there are a lot of different ways that we, um, you know, we, we talk about and we talk about why these are okay or we talk about why we want to be able to use them and, and the big one that, that Alex and I often hear is that, the, that it's too expensive to pay people. Um, and you know kind of our response to that is that if we value a more diverse workforce, then we need to put our money where our mouth is, you know, show me your budget and I'll show you what you value. We find the money to fly all over the world and attend conferences, to put gasoline in our field vehicles and in our boats. We find the money to get the equipment and put people through the training so that we can assure the ethical treatment of all the animals that we care about. Why, why can't we find the money for the people? Why, why are we putting people below all of those other things? And I realize that in some ways that's an overgeneralization, but I think it's really important to realize that if we value the people and if we value a more diverse workforce, then, then we need to be looking at changes. The other rationalization that we hear a lot of times is that, well, I had an unpaid job, thus you must also have an unpaid job, or that, you know, that job over there is way worse than this one, and so it's fine. And, 
you know, I don't want to get into like the really long history of humans using that excuse to justify things way worse than not paying people. But I, what I would argue is that instead of getting into this contest of finding people who are worse off, we should be building our workplaces around things that are accessible and that help people to grow professionally and develop skills. I would argue that not being able to pay your rent doesn't help you develop professional skills and it isn't accessible. There are things that are really hard, that are really difficult, that are really unpleasant, that do help people to grow professionally. But financial anxiety, I would argue, is not one of those things. And so this paper came out in 2015. Um, we got a lot of various feedback that I'm gonna walk you guys through here um, fairly quickly. Um, perhaps our, our favorite piece of feedback was the anonymous email that I received as a PhD student um, saying that my career was over and that no one would hire me because of this, which was really just an exciting thing to have someone send anonymously, especially. Um, but a lot of the reactions we got were a lot more positive and, and constructive. Um, we received a lot of feedback from technicians who were really thrilled to see their struggle in the literature, to see something that they were dealing with. Um, and within the months after that paper came out and across the past five years, we've had lots of people reach out that their organizations, their departments, their agencies, their professional societies are using this paper to help change policies, which was one of the reasons I was super excited when um, SMM reached out to me to be a part of this panel was here's another professional society who is willing to engage with this really hard topic. It's a really difficult one, right? And so we've, we've gotten a lot of really encouraging feedback that way. Um, if I could go back and rewrite the paper today, the thing that I would do especially is do a much better job of framing the paper that even if we had the money tomorrow to pay everybody, it would not solve all of our diversity, equity, and inclusion problems, right? There are a whole slew of challenges that people face before they even enter university, much less graduate and enter the workforce. And we did not do a good job of acknowledging that in the paper, and we should have. Um, and so that, that is um, a criticism that we got from a lot of different people that was very well-founded. Um, and hopefully we did it a little bit better in the next paper. So after that, Alex and I um, connected with Margaret and Angus, who are both economists, um, and they had access to survey data from the UK Higher Education Statistics Agency. And so basically what this, this um, agency in the UK does is they survey university graduates six months after they graduate from university and then three and a half years after they graduate from university. They ask them a bunch of questions about their employment status and then they also have a bunch of information about their, their demographics. And so this was published last year in PLUS One and I'll, I'll have links to the papers at the end and I'll also throw them in the chat. Um, so not to get too far down into the weeds, but kind of the two big things we found is that Taking a pay, having a paid job in STEM six months after university resulted in a higher probability of still working in a STEM career at three and a half years after graduation. Um, and it's, it's higher than having an unpaid position at six months. And we also found a positive relationship between having a paid position six months out of undergraduate and salary three and a half years after graduation, whereas there was a negative um, uh, effect with um, unpaid work. And so we're not finding the um, kind of the promise that comes from that get your foot in the door and everything will work out. Um, you know, I will say this is this is one study in one country. There are a lot of caveats to this that I'm not going to get into because of time, but please read the paper. I would love to, to continue to do this work other places in the world. I would love to do it here in the US because I think we have a very different reality in a lot of ways than the UK when it comes to our job market, um, I think that we might find a different story. And I'm sure that would be true in many, many other countries around the world. So I hope people will continue to do this work. So in brief, um, hopefully we can stop um, conversations where we relate financial resources to dedication. Um, you know, even even in situations where we're going to continue to have unpaid positions, I think it's really important to, to still break that connection and to, to not try and trick people into thinking that because they're poor, they don't care because that's just not the case. Um, in my experience, ornithology has a huge cultural problem around this. I'm not a marine mammologist. And I'm not gonna tell you guys what your, your struggles may or may not be, but I'm happy to share what I've learned from dealing with bird folks. Um, unpaid and underpaid work it, it's not accessible in, in many situations. It removes worker protections, which can be super dangerous. And we don't have evidence that it pays off long-term. 
And the thing that I spend a lot of time talking to with my, the senior leadership in my professional societies, who are primarily people over the age of 60 who haven't been a student in a really long time, is that the recent graduates of today are in a very different reality. They have higher student loan debt. Many more of them have children than did in their generation. Many more of them are sending money home to support family. And now we also expect folks to have a cell phone and a car and health insurance and car insurance and all these different things. And so the financial reality that these recent graduates are dealing with as they're entering into this career path is very different than what some of our leadership have experienced. And so I hope we can all develop a little bit of empathy as well. And so I am happy to take your questions when we do the Q&A at the end. Please do not throw your rotten vegetables at me. Um, I realize this is not gonna be a popular um, viewpoint that everyone will share and that's totally fine. I'm happy to chat with you all about that. I will throw the link for my website where you can get the papers um, in the chat. And then there's also a blog post. I'll put the link in the chat as well where Alex and I took the um, feedback we got from our 2015 paper and we wrote up some responses, so. Thank you all for your time, and I look forward to answering your questions at the end. Thank you so much, Ariel. That was really nice. It's, it's really good to get the perspective um, from you from a different field, and there's I think there's quite a bit of overlap. So I'm sure there'll be some good discussion uh, later on. Okay, I think we'll um, move next to Diane Gendron. Uh, Diane is a professor and researcher in cetacean ecology uh, with focus on uh, monitoring blue whales in the Gulf of California, promoting conservation of the North Pacific population. Um, Diane uh, accepts seasonal unpaid interns to work with her program in Mexico, and she provides um, them with partial support uh, while they're in the field. So we'll uh, switch to her. And Diane, I understand you don't have a uh, presentation, correct? No, not really. Okay, yeah. that's fine. That's good. Please take it away, Diane. Good, good evening, everyone. Um, my talk will be very different than uh, the previous one. Uh, in terms of, of uh, uh, I thought it was very interesting in, in all what uh, Tara said. Anyway, uh, uh, needs to be a thing very deeply, but <clears throat> my, um, participation uh, was because there was an invitation to a Mexican or Latin American uh, researcher to give an insight of what we, how it works in Mexico, for example. So I, I because I had almost 30 years of experience uh, working with student and research project, I thought uh, my contribution could be interesting as a, <clears throat> Mexican point of view, and also uh, SOMEMA, the Society for Mexican um, Marine Mammal Biology uh, agreed to do a little very short survey. It was a very short time to do that, but I'll give you some, some of this uh, result. But, but first I would like to um, just give you my point of view very quickly. Um, at about 35 years ago, I did work as a volunteer for three seasons in, uh, in up North Quebec, I'm, I'm Canadian. And I have no doubt now that this experience was decisive in my choice, my opportunities, and ultimately my career. I would never have found out Baja California or Blue Wells by myself. So, uh, and it was, uh, it was unpaid. Uh, I, had, I had to work in, in between, but it was a choice that I, I made to, to get involved into study of marine mammal, especially cetacean, anyway. So now in the point of view of a researcher 30 years later or more, um, I, 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 Still think it's a great opportunity, especially for a student in Mexico. And personally, I wanted to give the opportunity. It, it, to me, is 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 more like giving the opportunity to any Mexican who has not even experienced at sea to be part of a, a team for a season and to learn how we do research. 
Um, of course, they, they don't have to pay for lodging and food and all this, but there's no, there's no salary. There's no, there's no really money for that. Anyway, so this is my, my, my case, and I think many of my Mexican colleagues. And um, also, there's a, a great, I would say, benefit for the researcher. In my case, I'm a teacher for a, a postgraduate study, master and in, in, in PhD. And the student enrolled, they don't have time to spend three months in the field. They have classes. They have to do other things. They have to do lab uh, in very short time too. So they, they, they don't, unfortunately, the student don't have as much experience as the, uh, the voluntary who, who come down and stay for the full, full season. So that's, uh, that's a very uh, a great opportunity, I think, for them. And also to decide, is that what they really like? To be at sea, to be you know, in, in a boat all day? Do, do you have patience, et cetera? They can discover the quality they need to do that kind of research also. <clears throat> anyway, so um, and, and another very important point in Mexico is that um, undergraduate students, they, they need to serve um, as, a, uh, as a voluntary work. It's part of most of the institution for a couple of months. And uh, so they call that social work or um, voluntary social work. And also other, uh, plus that some other institution have what they call professional practice. So uh, they have to be part of a, of a lab or learning something in their field. Sometimes it's in the same city, so they don't need a real salary. But if it's in the field, it costs a little bit more money anyway. But that is all already into the, the program for <clears throat> uh, undergraduate study. So I think it was important to mention that uh, before I continue with the survey. Um, so uh, like I said, we have li very little time to do the survey, but 15 answers from 10, 10 institutions and three uh, NGO from Mexico. And there's many more NGO. Um, institute, I mean, uh, university or institution that has a marine mammal program, there's not that many. I think 10 is probably representative of what, uh, what we do in Mexico. And we also made another survey for the student to know, to have an, an, an idea of how, how back, uh, looking back, these some of these students did voluntary work. How did they, they feel about it? So basically, um, uh, basically uh, all the institution that, uh, all the researchers that answered, only two didn't, did the survey because one said something very similar that uh, it was mentioned in the, the, the previous talk about the um, uh, problems with uh, medical insurance or accident that could happen in the field, which is quite obviously uh, present, right? So uh, that institution doesn't, do not accept voluntary because of that. And the other uh, had no money or, or, or no project yet. Okay, so <clears throat> of, the, of the rest, 92% um, were uh, say that they 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 have voluntary uh, student every year, and only eight percent was occasionally. So I think my experience is also um, in the same context here for the the survey, <clears throat> and uh, we ask um, age group in terms of undergraduate, postgraduate student, and most of them. I mean. No, hundred uh, percent of the of the uh, undergrad. Um, I mean, of the, the voluntary comes from undergraduate. And only sixty-two percent from postgraduate. <clears throat> it's kind of understandable because at the master level, there's not much time uh, to do other kind of voluntary work than your own project, right? But but still, there are uh, 
voluntary unpaid work there. And most um, uh, gave food and lodging, 54%, uh, transportation, and some other uh, small bursary, 8%. <clears throat> and in general, 87% um, uh, were satisfied and 16% very satisfied of the work of the uh, student. I'm still talking about student, not, not the master or, or PhD. <clears throat> and in the terms of the student, same kind of uh, percentage. Um, undergraduate, most of them were uh, accept to do voluntary work. Uh, same percent of uh, food and lodging uh, or accommodation and transportation. <clears throat> Some of them were mentioning aside the, the, the little survey that they would have uh, liked to be paid, of course, if we ask that question. And 62% uh, and were very satisfied of their work, of, of the, the work they did, and, and the rest satisfied. Satisfied and 13% were not satisfied. That is something interesting. Anyway, <clears throat> um, so I hope it gives a, a, a different idea of, of the um, possibility in Mexico. So several institutions, several uh, marine mammal program in research, and most of them accept voluntary work and they're not paid, but they, they have uh, food and lodging uh, to help them. So. Uh, I hope I hope this uh, little presentation uh, raised some question or ideas. Uh, to my view, uh, in my experience, it was very important in my life for my career, and I'm happy to um, share that with with Mexican student and also a student from uh, outside the Mexico. Thank you. Thanks, Diane. It's that's very nice. It's uh, definitely good to have the you know, a perspective from a, a, a Latin American country, um, and and one where uh, unpaid work and volunteers have been you know influential in the science. Um, let's see. Okay, next up is Tara Cox. Uh, Tara is. Um, a professor at Savannah State, and also secretary and um, and my partner in crime, co-chair of the Ad Hoc Diversity Inclusion Committee. Um, Sinter has been working uh, a lot with uh, uh, increasing diversity in, in her area and uh, has both paid and unpaid interns in our lab. So it'd be nice to have her perspective. Um, so Tara, take it away. Thanks, Eric. So like Eric said, I'm the secretary of the Society for Marimology and the co-chair with Eric on the Ad Hoc Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Um, and so I first wanna open up by reiterating what Charles said and thank Erin and her colleagues for writing the letter, getting it, getting it so much momentum. I think that's where the community of scientists and the Society for Marimology that's where we can do the most good is have these conversations. However, I think I'm on this panel for a slightly different reason in that um, the hat, my day job is a professor of marine sciences at Savannah State University in Savannah, Georgia in the US. And that um, Savannah State University is a historically black college and university, which um, is a minority serving institution and those H, we call them HBCUs are chronically underfunded in um, the US and have been. And so um, like Eric said, I take both paid and um, unpaid interns in my lab and I wanna bring a slightly different perspective. I followed all of the back and forth and all of the perspectives of people. Um, and I really appreciate Ariel's um, perspective on and the point that we have to think about who didn't get through. Um, again, in my lab, what has happened is we've had unpaid interns for about six or seven years and we bring them in and, and 
three different seasons. They stayed for three to four months and get experience while they're helping us collect our data. Meanwhile, I have my undergraduates who have to do a senior research internship. And there's no way during the semester, like Diane was saying, there's no way during the semester they could actually collect enough data. And so they're using our 10 to 12, I guess it's about 12 year data set now to ask scientific questions and do their research internship. Meanwhile, I'm also the principal investigator on a US funded, um, what's National Science Foundation research experience for undergraduates program. And so we bring um, 10 usually minority students, um, very diverse group, a lot of parents, um, veterans, as well as um, minorities to be prepared for research and give them a paid internship over the summer. Again, for the marine mammal segment of that in my lab, those folks um, would not have a decent data set in our very short program. So instead they're using our long-term data set which ironically has been really bolstered by unpaid interns. Having said that, I will also say that it has been a very rocky ride to have unpaid interns and paid interns. And the um, I've learned a lot along the way that I think we all should think about. Um, with the unpaid interns, I now feel like I do, do a much better job than I did years ago when they first started. But now I treat it much more as a mentorship. They, um, I provide whatever they want. I meet, try and meet with them the first couple of weeks and figure out what they want out of the program. And then we work towards that. Sometimes they want a specific project. Sometimes they're getting college credit. Sometimes they're, um, they want guidance to get to grad school. I help them with contacts. I have used um, my indirect cost recovery to take them to regional marine mammal meetings um, as much as possible. So um, it's not ideal and I'm not a fan of unpaid internships, um, but I will not lie and say our lab has very much benefited. But on the flip side, a lot of students who um, would not get the experience otherwise also are benefiting from the years of work that the unpaid interns have done. So for me, it's a little bit more complicated than um, just saying unpaid internships are bad. Um, and again, in a chronically underfunded situation, and I, I shared with some people on the board that we have, I, I teach, my, we're mainly a teaching institution. We do have a master's in marine science program, but um, most of my time is spent te teaching. So if I can get little pieces of money, I will do so. But for example, recently I just received um, some money to for four weeks of field work and photo ID. So I wouldn't be able to bring someone in from who has photo ID experience from somewhere else and pay them. So what I ended up doing was paying a couple of my unpaid interns for the last month. So um, because they already had the training. So it's complicated and we do the best we can. I just want to make sure that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and that for some of us, um, the unpaid internships are helping us meet our ultimate goal or my ultimate goal of increasing diversity in the field. Um, again, like Ariel said, we can try and find other ways to fund those, but I would like us to be open to lots of different options. And I think, again, I, I really, really appreciate that Erin and her colleagues brought this issue up um, and that now we can have this broad discussion of what can we do to really um, increase diversity and inclusion in our society because we are a community um, under Ann Papp's leadership and now Charles's we've talked a lot on the board about what the society means to us and for most of us we grew up in this society we it's a community and we want everyone to feel welcome in that community and so hopefully everybody feels welcome to speak their minds and help us navigate this surprisingly complex path that we are trying to forge. And um, so I am 
very open to questions and thoughts and Eric and I really would love your input, not just on the unpaid internships, but on the much broader issues of diversity and inclusion with our society. Thanks. Thanks, Tara. That is also a really important, useful perspective, and I'm sure I'll we'll come back and touch on some of those issues in the discussion. Um, to finish, uh, we have our, our panel. Uh, we have uh, Cindy Peter, who is a coordinator for the Sarawak Dolphin Research Project uh, at the Institute for Biodiversity and Environmental Conservation at the University of Malaysia Sarawak. Sarawak. Uh, she's also a member at large for the Society for Marine Mammalogy, and uh, she's uh, we're, we're lucky to have her here to give voice to um, uh, some of the issues in in Southeast Asia. So I'll just turn it over to Cindy, thank you. Hi, thanks Eric for the introduction. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening everyone. It is uh, about 10 minutes to 10, so I'm a little bit um, active probably, I've had my coffee, uh, but I'll be talking just a short while and I'll be switching off my video so that uh, I can save some bandwidth um, and you can hear me um, clearly. So since the unpaid internship issue was brought up, uh, the Asian marine mammal researchers started pouring uh, our thoughts and insight in a WhatsApp group of which more, most of us in the region are a part of. Um, in July, we had a Zoom discussion on this to hear everyone's perspective and additional contributions were made to an online document. So we came up with a statement and other issues which plagued most of the Asian researchers and uh, shared the document with the board members. I'm here today to share our perspective and opinions uh, and also some actions that may more effectively improve diversity and inclusion within the SMM. Now, these are not my opinion alone, so I must thank my fellow researchers and friends who helped us polish our statement. Um, next. Katerina. Right, thank you. Uh, no, second slide, please. So thank you. So the Southeast Asian Marine Mammal Group, or CMAMA as we call ourselves, is a research and conservation collective that includes all people, regardless of race, religion, culture, or gender, uh, based in Asia. Originally, we focused on research within the waters of Brunei, Cambodia, East Timor, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam, the marine waters of China from the Yangtze River South, including Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Macau, and the northern waters of Australia from the Torres Strait West to Broome in Western Australia. However, we welcome all researchers from uh, working in Asia uh, to our discussions and meetings. So we have held a regional meetings since 1995, and between these meetings, we arrange a variety of workshops to build capacity in Asian marine mammal research and conservation uh, initiatives. We also contribute to global initiatives such as the IUCN Important Marine Mammal Areas uh, Workshop and the Scientific Committee of the International Welling Commission. So we work within a variety of sectors. Uh, there's academics, uh, nonprofit organizations, non-government organizations, consulting companies, and also uh, individuals. Several of our group members also serve on the board of SMM and on its various subcommittees. Now, we are also a big proponent of gamification in marine mammals. So if you see a bunch of people playing Jenga during the biennials, chances are you've just chanced upon um, the emerging group of uh, Asian researchers. Uh, next. Some members of our group's initial reaction was that the petition and the discussion surrounding it uh, did not impact Asian researchers as internships in the sense that they were being discussed are not the common practice in this region. Uh, indeed, in some Asian languages, there is no equivalent term for internship. Uh, therefore, we uh, discussed about what are the meanings of intern, uh, unpaid position, uh, and volunteer, and what this might mean uh, in different Asian uh, countries. Uh, next. 
there was some discussion on what might differentiate a work experience or a volunteer position from a position that should require remuneration. So a working time frame of more than three months was generally agreed to be a period of work that should not be offered as an unpaid position. And in some Asian countries, these three months unpaid work is the maximum time frame legally allowed. So most Asian countries have guidelines and regulations that advise how long unpaid position might be and what work constitutes as a reasonable um, as reasonable within that position. Uh, next. So in some uh, Asian countries, tertiary institute degrees require the student to complete two months on-the-job training or OJT, uh, and institutes commonly approach NGOs to request student placements. Now, this provides NGOs with the support in a region where resources are already extremely limited, and it provides an insight to the work of marine mammal scientists and may encourage students to enter the field. It was noted that uh, the tertiary institutes do not provide financial support to either the student nor the entity which the students are placed in. And it was commented that the responsibility for ensuring students were not exploited should be fall to their institutes. Uh, and ideally, universities or colleges should only place students with entities that can play them, pay them. Uh, however, where marine mammal work is a concern is in Asia, that narrows down the already very few uh, opportunities available. Uh, next. In Asia, uh, NGOs welcome and actually grateful for the assistance that OJT students and volunteers provide. Now, during our discussion, it was noted that all members of the group had either participated in OJT uh, or similar and all had benefited from the volunteer experiences. And as such, we considered the opportunity to participate in active research and conservation programs as essential stepping stone into the field. Now, group members' experience varied from the mandatory requirement of their degrees, as well as volunteer positions uh, with local and regional NGOs or research program. Uh, most of us uh, stayed within our own country when uh, we did our OGT, although some do travel regionally to volunteer, and none felt like they were exploited or taken advantage of because that was their choice um, in the first place to go to uh, other country or other region. Now, for those members of the group that now accept volunteers, most of the requests come from students who already know the work the group does. It is very rare that uh, these NGOs or um, government uh, uh, organizations uh, have to advertise and several even receive unsolicited inquiries from overseas, requesting unpaid position to assist in the work being done. Now, both local and international volunteer contributions uh, play an important role in achieving the research and conservation goals of this group, uh, similar to what Tara mentioned. And in some cases, uh, even highlight the work of the group internationally, uh, which of course benefits the group in additional ways. Now, the solution to inequality uh, opportunity within the field of marine mammal science cannot come from small NGOs because their budgets are small and often restricted. Uh, it was agreed uh, that donors and funding foundations must take more responsibility by providing funding for early career scientists. Uh, next. Now, SMM could develop better guidelines to assist potential students or graduates on how best to evaluate an unpaid position and so that it is beneficial to future careers. Uh, SMM should require that any request posted on the website for positions should clearly define what these position types are, as well as the scope of work expected from the applicants, where their source of funds are from, and the nature of the entity the applicant would be working for. Uh, next. Now, other than the unpaid internship issue, which is the reason why uh, we're here today, our discussions also tried to identify real barriers to working in the field of marine mammal science in Asia. Now, there are two main issues that SMM could provide support and assistance to. First is the lack of entry-level job opportunities. 
Now, this is a huge gap which has to be overcome by most of uh, the Asian students. There are already very few employment opportunities for new graduates, even if they have had a lot of volunteer experience in the field. Now, without opportunities to start on the employment ladder, potential careers are thwarted from the onset. Uh, SMM could highlight this gap in job opportunities and actively promote, firstly, tr through the university or through their own uh, institutes and encourage the creation of more entry level uh, opportunities. Uh, next. So in general, uh, most grants that are accessible to small Asian NGOs exclude salaries as a component. Uh, this compounds the issue which was already mentioned previously and makes it extremely difficult for active uh, Asian marine mammal research groups to provide career opportunities uh, for graduates interested working in this field. Now, SMM could assess their own research processes or research grant processes and either remove restrictions on providing salaries or monetary support for uh, the research staff. Uh, next. In addition, for those grants that wish to advertise via the SMM platform, the board could assess the rules of that grant and ensure that the funding criteria do not restrict the ability of research projects to provide paid positions, which is very critical to the success of the research and which promotes uh, capacity building. Of course, these are not the only barriers to a career in marine mammal science in Asia. Uh, however, these are issues that we feel that SMM could make real contribution to. Uh, next. It was generally agreed that the lack of diversity and the challenges encountered by some genders, cultures, and nationalities in Asia entering the field of marine mammal science is little to do with unpaid internship. In fact, by restricting the ability of SMM to advertise any opportunity for work experience, paid or not, on its website, creates additional barriers and reduces opportunities. So while our group empathizes with the intention of the petition, which was to make feel the field of marine mammal science as inclusive as, inclusive as, in, as possible, it is tackling the issue from a very uh, narrow uh, point of view, in our opinion. Further, the petition authors also did not consider the experience or reality of groups who do come from countries or cultures that are poorly represented within the marine mammal science. Uh, next. Internship uh, or volunteer or OJT positions are not obstacles to people who wish to enter the field of marine mammal science in Asia, but instead provide opportunities that they would not otherwise have. Um, the SMM website, website should be an open hub of information for all aspects of marine mammal science and not in itself uh, exclude opportunities. So our group concluded that the open letters written by Clapham and the uh, SMM International Relations Committee, International Relation, uh, Committee uh, articulated the feelings of this group well. If it, was, if it was not for the opportunities provided by internship or volunteer position, it would have been even harder for us in CMAMA to enter the field of marine mammal science. Uh, the SMM can play a more active role in reducing obstacles by facilitating entry-level job opportunities and promoting grants and awards that do not restrict uh, salaries or stipend. Uh, next. So thank you, CSA. Terima kasih. Kapkun ka for your attention and to uh, SMM for giving me this chance uh, to speak on behalf of our group uh, in Asia. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much, Cindy. That was um, that was fantastic. It's definitely good to have uh, that perspective in this discussion, um, and I think that that definitely rounds out some of the, uh, the the issues we've been having about or questions we've been having about uh, what is being provided and and who is benefiting. Um, I think now we'll uh, move to uh, just starting to field some questions to the panelists. We've been getting quite a few in Q&A and I just invite people to continue to um, put them in Q&A or uh, through Facebook 
or again on the Google form. I'm going to paste that link uh, to the form momentarily. There. Um, and I think we'll we'll start out with a maybe a general question uh, for the the panelists that I've, um, has come up in several of the questions, um, and it's a definition question that Cindy Cindy touched on um, how we see uh, the difference between unpaid in internships, volunteers, students, and you know this entire sort of class of things because I think having a, um, a good idea of, of the differences and, and, and Cindy and some of the others touched on these uh, will help guide some of our, our discussions. So um, I'll just open that up to the, the panelists. Um, how do you see these differences and, and do you see them as being important in this discussion? I, I guess I can start. <laughs> um... I, I think that there is a really big difference between um, often the things that fall under the realm of like citizen or community science, things that take, you know, a small number of hours a month, something that could be done, you know, in an afternoon on an occasion versus expecting someone to move and live in a remote or, you know, otherwise place and work a full time job. And both of those could be called volunteering, but I think they're very different asks of a person, right? Um, whether or not you would call one of those an internship or not, I think it just has a lot to do with the kind of organization that you work in, at least based on my experience. Um, but yeah, I, I think that there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of nuance between, hey, would you like to come help for two hours on Saturday versus, hey, would you like to work unpaid for the next year, 80 hours a week? Like, those are two very different things. Eric, can I can I weigh in? Um, I'm and I'm sorry, I'm not turning on my video. Apparently, the the bandwidth isn't great here. Um, but I, I think a lot of people have mentioned this in the comments, and and I 100% agree that we need to have our definitions a little bit tighter. And and I don't know what those definitions are. Maybe I've been using the wrong terms. But and and there is a continuum, right? I mean, I in my lab, I have people who live in Savannah and can't go anywhere else. So they, you know, get experience in my lab and they come when they can come, um, you know? And so there, there are, like Ariel just said, there are different variations on this theme. And, and, and I think Colleen Reckmuth has been putting some really interesting things in the comments that, you know, we need to make sure we're all talking similar language and that we aren't getting rid of all opportunities just to um, get rid of some. Yeah, I think that's the, um, and, and I guess that in general, uh, I want to throw out there that I think one of the reasons that this is polarizing is because people see this as a um, all or nothing thing. I think some of these discussions have been, you either have um, uh, unpaid positions and, and then you've got you know, very little money to do your science or you, you don't and, uh, and, or sorry, the other way, you've got unpaid positions and you, you can get your science done or you pay uh, interns and your, your money goes um, out the door just to pay for people and you can't do the science. Um, and I, I, I guess I just wanna caution us from seeing them as, as only those two extremes. Um, as Tara said, she's uh, as described, she's uh, you know, running a shop where you've got sort of both going on. And, and I think it'd be worthwhile to, to think about um, about having um, both of those extremes represented, you know, in in these positions, but it is clearly a um, a zero sum game. You know, you have a fixed amount of dollars to do the science, and the question is, is is where they go? Where 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 do you put that money? Um, but I I don't think that it has to be these two extremes.
Yeah, and one of the points that Cindy made, I think, was a, a really good one, that there are so many um, funding bodies that restrict the use of funds for salary money. And that's one place that my professional organizations have been starting to work, which is to approach funding organizations and say, hey, if you actually value these things, you need to allow the people who receive that money to pay people. And that can be, I'm not telling you guys what you, what you should do, just giving examples of like, you know, if, if there's money out there, but it's restricted in what it can be used for, that can be, be a problem as well. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Ariel. That actually leads to a another uh, question that's come up in, in comments that have come up in, in several different places. And it is what is the, um, you know, revolves around the experience of, of shifting grant support um, to, to cover funding, um, either asking for more because you, you have, it's, it's part of the project to pay for um, the, the labor um, or, or force or, 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 or shifting the support to say, you know, I'm going to do less science, but I'm going to pay people more. Um, can anybody in the panel speak to um, experiences with making those sorts of shifts? Uh, if you want, uh, um, I think the, the, the research funding, at least in Mexico, as, as um, Tara mentioned too, I mean, yeah, funding for salary is very complicated, but finding money outside, outside the research, I mean, outside the government, outside the, <clears throat> when we basically look for funding, it's, it's easier. And in my uh, opinion, that's where um, even I, I, I think the uh, student that, that are in the position, uh, they have a master, they have new idea, it's the time to help them uh, you know, with new ideas and, and having salary from NGOs or, or other kind of funding to that. But there's a point where these students need to fly by themselves too. Um, it's hard to explain, but my, my thoughts is, is uh, it's hard to find salary every season. You know, it's, it's hard to, hide, to find funding for salary every season, but it, it's, easy, it's easier to have new ID, new project with salary uh, for these ex-students, for example, and push them and help them to continue in that sense. But um, for me, uh, in, in, uh, for I think most of my colleagues in Mexico, uh, research funding is really, really hard to have salary, even per diem for people who works uh, in our cen center, it's, it's difficult. So um, if we go in that direction, in, in our case, uh, I think we wouldn't be able to go in the field and we wouldn't be able to, to complete like uh, 25 years of field works, like long-term, um, not very expensive, but every season or every year. Anyway, it's my, just an idea about salary and funding. Yeah, thanks. That's 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 clearly uh, the the issue that I think a lot of, of NGOs uh, feel. And this actually came up in a question that we should you know recognize that there's a there's a dif this difference in in scale in small NGOs that um, that where a large percent of their budget you know goes to just operating costs and uh, and you know, I can see it'd be hard to get you know grants to um to fund salaries for them worth versus sort of larger groups either universities or government organizations um or larger projects that that might be able to get more money and, and do you know good research and yet still um have uh the ability to pay for some positions so i think that's a that was a really good comment that we should keep that uh issue of scale in mind 
Um, we have about 15 minutes left in our allotted time. And there is one issue that's come up or a question that I, I think it's worth to, to just put on the table. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's the issue, it's the question of, of seeing unpaid interns or um, unpaid yeah, positions, volunteers, as being a, um, an, an issue of ethics. Um, and there seems to be several camps where um, people, uh, I think, get, uh, get concerned about it being seen as an ethical issue because I think if they have um, unpaid interns, that means that they're unethical, whereas others see it as, I think, an ethical issue, both for using um, uh, the, both the, the idea that that doors are being potentially closed, or or people aren't don't have access, and um, and another interesting uh, uh, point that came up was um, that you have these um, positions where people uh, can can easily get into the field or can sort of pay to get in, yet they uh, their jobs are so limited in the field that they can't move past a certain position. So are we making um, through these unpaid uh, positions uh, a sort of glut of people that stop at a, at a given place and, and can never really make it further? So I, I think it's it, just as a general question, um, you know, I'd like to open up the discussion of, of, of this issue as being one of, of, of ethics and, and if not, how we should think about it. I mean, it, it, I, I would love to hear what Ariel has to say because I know she's been through this process and seen the the growing pains and the angst of, I mean, I think Colleen has really been capturing some of my thoughts and I don't know if people can see the Q&A in chat, but you know, it, it's hard not to feel defensive and yet I'm trying to be very open-minded about, um, about the the veracity of of how people are feeling and feeling taken advantage of and so it would be really good to hear from errol if you have some insight and in how how we get past that or through that i don't think we want to get past it but through um the the ethical conversation to getting to some common ground yeah i mean this is this is the hard part, right? Like this is not, this is not a, I mean, it has one easy situation and we just all find a big pot of money, but that's not actually realistic. So it's, you know, this is a problem that doesn't have a simple answer. And I, I'm not an ethicist. I don't, to me, it seems like an ethical issue, but that I think just has a lot to do with my own very personal worldview. And I'm not gonna put that on all of you, but um the, the conversations and the struggles that I've seen in, in my professional societies I, are, are very similar to the, the struggles I see around a lot of issues with diversity and inclusion where people aren't willing to be uncomfortable and, and when they feel defensive, they, they, um, they don't respond by sitting with that discomfort. And I think that's often the first, the first step is to listen and to try and find the common values. Because um, I mean, at the end of the day, all of you care a lot about marine mammals and about their environments and about so many other things that you guys have in common. So finding those common values and finding a way to have a conversation around them and, and realizing that it can be true that the folks for who, that cannot take unpaid jobs feel that that is exclusionary to them that can be true and it can also be true that people rely on those unpaid internships to make their own living because they need to get research done and that's really hard and that is not the fault of the marine mammal community it's a you know it's kind of a fault of our current humanity um it's it is it is really hard um yeah i've I, I think a lot of it just comes down to trying to find trying to find that common ground and and to recognize that you know we've 
we've all got a lot of growing to do. Yeah, that's a really good point, Ariel. And I think um, I, I, I go back to what I said before, at the beginning is that um, I think we should all recognize that everybody um, in this discussion in this field, you know, is is passionate, and and many of us are um, are are focused on making the world a better place. And it's really not just the um, you know the animals we work on, but the people around us. And and one of the interesting things I you know noticed from this is that um, you hear you know sort of both sides saying um, that they're interested in opening the field to more people. And, and people just see that there are different ways of doing that. Um, you know, one side is I think saying, well, uh, I don't have the money, um, but I can provide a workspace. I can provide in experience and, and, um, and mentoring. And um, if, if you, know, you have the ability to, 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 to come and do that, um, I can open this field for you. And another side says, well, but that is closing the door to somebody else. It's, it's limiting um, the people that can do that to a certain group. And, and that then dovetails to an issue that um, that group is different depending on where you are. Um, there's and there's uh, you know, different sort of socioeconomic um, relationships uh, in different countries and different regions that um, makes those biases different. And, and at least the one, one thing I'd like to see is just people being aware of the, uh, the opportunity cost on both sides. Um, you know, we're, we, we miss out someplace, um, but if we make a decision being aware of that, I think we're, um, we're at least better off because we're still focusing on, you know, doing good work. Um, just, sorry, quickly scrolling through because there was another comment I wanted to get before we ended up our time. And, oh, okay, that was it. Um, I think the another ma major thread that's been going through some of the, the questions and comments has been uh, one of utility. And there's, this has got two different uh, or two related axes. And one of them is um, what people see as being the, the usefulness of, in, of internships, the utility of them. And this sounds like a, a trivial question, but uh, have, has there been uh, experiences, you know, following trajectory of people um, sort of taking uh, internships, not previously, but more recently, um, and how their uh, career trajectory has, has gone. And then uh, is there a um, kind of relationship of the significance of these, um, or yeah, of, of that career trajectory and how important that internship is to the person rather than the institution. I think that's a, a balance that we want to keep in mind that the, um, ideally you're, you're helping the science, but you're also helping the people that are participating in the science. Um, so um, I, yeah, again, just sort of throwing it out there, um, have, have, has, has there been follow-up on how people that in different types of internship programs fare later on in their career. I'm not sure of a broader question. I, I, I read one person who asked specifically about individuals. I mean, I don't think we have the data, um, especially like Ariel presented from her paper, but um, I mean, from my personal perspective and I, would have to go back through and look at actual numbers, but um, most of the unpaid interns, not, I would say most of the unpaid interns who have come through my lab are still in the field, as are most of my graduate students who have come through. Um, and when in the field of marine mammal science, I do, most of my undergraduates though have gone um, 
on to graduate programs in other fields. So, um, but having said that, a, a lot of my unpaid interns, I end up writing them letters of recommendation, helping making connections in the field. And um, several of them have gone on to graduate school or gone on to observer positions. Um, but again, that's anecdotal. I don't, and I do tracking of all of my REU interns. So we have specific data on those. So we could do something like that with unpaid internships. And that's probably something that could come as a recommendation. I, I do think a best practices guidelines would be really helpful coming from the society. And I see that possibly happening. And, and one of the best guide, best practices would be to track the data somehow. Um. In, in my experience with the literature, there's there's not a ton within the life sciences on this. Um, there's there's some in business, there's some in law, um, where unpaid work is also quite common, um, and they and they find kind of similar things to what Alex and Margaret and Angus and I found, where it, where it can be a barrier. Um, but there's there's certainly a lot of need to better understand this in the life sciences, and I think even at a finer scale than just the life sciences, you know, within marine mammalogy, within ornithology, but that is, unfortunately, um, I'm not aware of any of it, so. Thanks. Um, I think the last question I want to pose um, has come up through, uh, you know, various uh, avenues here. It's It's been one of, um, you know, given that that uh, you know we we have this this cohort of people, obviously that that are um, excluded from the field, and we have students coming in, and we you know have a, a uh, sort of a regular dialogue with them. I think that it, it you know goes it's it's difficult to find funding, it's difficult to find a position. Um, I I'm wondering, especially since we have a lot of those people on the line, um, what what do we say to them? If, if you have somebody who cannot uh, afford to, to, to take a volunteer position, to take an unpaid internship, to get that experience, um, what are the other avenues? Are there other avenues? Um, how, how do we help them navigate this field? Um, and, or, or, or is it truly um, you know, sort of relegated to just those that, that can support themselves, or are, are there other avenues for people to to get in and make a career? Um, I mean, I, I can speak to kind of wildlife ecology more broadly. I've I've mentored students who, I, I, I guess this, the first thing I always start out and tell them is that your time and your effort has value and that you know you your contributions are valuable because some of them take away from these unpaid jobs that they are just like a cog in the machine. Um, and so I try to always emphasize to them that their time and, and their contribution is really valuable. And for some of them, I've, I've helped them to see that given their restrictions in life that you know going off to some remote part of the world when they don't have the financial resources is probably not feasible in the short term. And I've helped them find other pathways through ecology that they found to be really exciting and rewarding. Um, and, that, and that's really hard for them and it's not a fun thing to talk them through, but I also don't, I don't wanna, you know, don't wanna sell them a sack of crap, right? Like I wanna, I wanna help them find the best path forward for themselves. I, I do, I will also say, I mean, I, I never did an unpaid internship. I actually am from Kansas and electroshocked bass in a local lake because I was stuck in Kansas and couldn't get a marine mammal job. And so, I mean, I always tell people who are trying to get in, in the field, find any kind of field experience. If you can radio track snakes in Oklahoma, that's going to give you experience that someone may snatch up. And so um, 
so there are i think there there are ways to make it into the field um without doing you know having to do marine mammal work um a, a lot of people actually in the field came from other fields and so i mean i think we do need to i don't want to dismiss we need to move forward to paying as many people as possible in the field um because i don't think it's necessarily a good thing to be taking um but i think we all need to be realistic about the money that is coming in or not coming in and I, i've seen a lot of comments saying you know why can't you write this into your grants i i didn't have any startup money i didn't have any you know any i don't have any support from my institution and i teach most of the time i get like a one month of summer work grant and so it's it's not like i have money raining down on you know and i'm buying big boats to do my work and i think a lot of ngos are in a very similar situation and so there's the there i think we have to come at this issue from multiple angles and i really like ariel's point of one point smm could do is work towards getting funding agencies to allow for salaries um if they don't allow for them and and we as a society have already done that with our um you know with our small grants and aid allowing them now so you know it's baby steps but i think there are multiple pathways that we have to take yeah thanks uh, just to round out this uh conversation before we uh, do a soft close here um cindy and diane if you're still on um, how, how do you answer or address that question uh, in your parts of the world uh, when, if you have people that uh, can't afford um, but, or, or have, you know, yeah, don't have the ability to, uh, to, to support themselves but want to get in the field? Uh, I'm still there. Maybe, um, uh, maybe Sandy, Cindy. Anyway, oh. um, <clears throat> I think it's a, it's a very big question. My somebody was uh, first of all. I just realized many people were asking me question and Q and answer, and this is a new computer, and I, I'm 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 doing a lot of weird thing right now i'm sorry but i wish i can answer all of them if they're for me um whatever but um in, in terms of the there's no uh, anybody who who can in in in, my, in our case i mean in my case and i'm sure my colleague is the same in mexico in mexico i'm not saying all latin american i don't think i've ever said that I think there's a very different uh, uh, economy and different things are, are happening in, in uh, Latin America anyway. But um, anybody who is interested in, in doing a voluntary work and write, in, 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 write to me or write to the researcher, I'm sure they will take it. Um, I mean, if, if you have many possibilities, you will make a choice, but the choice is not about if you can pay anything. I mean, everything is paid, the food, the, 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 the lodging there, to the transportation to the field. I mean, it's obvious you don't have to pay. I mean, the student, we're not expecting the student to pay for that, but, but there's no salary either. So if someone cannot reach, <clears throat> Uh, cannot leave for some reason, you know, because it, because of any reason. To 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 be a voluntary, I mean, there's nothing. Oh, I think I'm tired, but I, I mean, there's nothing we can do about that. It's it's like part of the life. It's a decision. Uh, sometimes you have to be adventurous in your life. Decide. I'm, I'm going to do this because I want to see if it's is that re really what I want to do. If you don't do it, you will never know. That's my own experience. 
And I understand not everybody has the possibility uh, to do that. It's obvious. But I don't think anybody choose for uh, possibilities of, 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 of you know, money or is everybody is the same level. It's just possibility, opportunity. Um, and, and I understand it's much more difficult now than it was before, I guess. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and Cindy. Uh, Hi, uh, I'm here. Yes, hi. Thanks, uh, Diane, and thanks, Eric. So, uh, because you know, I work in a university, and the ones who always come to me are usually students, and they've got big ideas. But, um, and of course, they come with, they come to me, and you know, someone just said recently, I want to do acoustic work. So I'm like, okay, uh, uh, I can try and help you, but uh, just be very clear that I do not have the fund just for the research, but I cannot pay you. So to this, um, where uh, I am, I'll tell them what I mean is that I'm very honest with, uh, I'm, I'm very honest with uh, the situation. I'll tell them I cannot pay you monthly si uh, salary, uh, but I can pay for um, uh, uh, boat time, uh, food, uh, the food during the field and things like that. So let's find a way to get you paid. And um, the best way, uh, one of the, well, I guess one of the best way to do that is to uh, apply for scholarships, either through the university. And of course, by scholarship, that means they would have to apply to be a grad student and things like that. Um, uh, so, you know, apply for scholarships, uh, uh, either by the government or by the university or by any um, other funding bodies you know, um, we can sort out, uh, like for example, I can say, if I have the money for the research, I, I'll, I'll tell this person, like, I can do the research with you. I just cannot pay you. And I want you to know that I, I think your research is good. Um, your idea is good, but I really don't feel like, you know, I should take advantage of you and things like that. So I think that being honest with them, sometimes they'll be like, oh, okay, I cannot, I cannot do the research because I don't have the, I'm not getting paid. Uh, I need to, you know, help uh, support my family. So we'll be like, okay, um, you know that that's that's uh, that's fine. We'll just find another way next time. So I think being very very honest with people um, is very very uh, useful and very very helpful. Uh, if they are not able to uh, to come and join us because they cannot uh, take unpaid position, just be very clear with them. Um, if they do want to find a way to fight uh, for their project or or to be a part of uh, 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 the research. Um, you know, we find other ways uh, to, uh, to do it. Uh, I've got students who um, help me around um, even during non-field work time. And because I feel, you know, I, I should compensate them. So I'll just do it from, from my own pocket money. Uh, it's not much, but, you know, I hope that it can help them. Of course, uh, that's always uh, not the best thing to do, you know, um, tr uh, trying to, to pay everyone from our own set. But uh, the very the very little that can help, I think I think uh, goes a long way. Um, so to to everyone, you know, don't don't uh, don't give up. Don't feel like you're being taken advantage of. Sometimes uh, we just need to talk. You know, conversation. That's why uh, at the beginning, uh, Charles said that you know we're not trying to look for a solution. We're just trying to start a conversation. Um, if there's uh, uh, if there's more noise or if there's more uh, minds put together, then probably we'll find a solution or we can push for the funders to start providing uh, salary uh, in, in, their, in their funding opportunity. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Cindy. That's, uh, that's really, uh, yeah, that, 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 that's a, 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 think a good way to, to finish this off. Um, we are, are 10 minutes past our, our official closing time. Um, and so I'd just like to take a moment to thank um, our four panelists for joining us and Charles and Katerina and Lindsay Porter and the rest of the, uh, the Board of Governors for uh, supporting this. Um, I think we've so far had a, a great discussion and there's been some some fantastic comments uh, coming through that we'll um, we'll we'll sift through, and and some very good ideas um, 
for ways to move forward. Uh, just you know, reiterating that we're obviously nowhere near a solution, but I think um, we've had some uh, really important uh, aspects of this issue um, you know, hashed out and it's a conversation that continues. Um, and I think there's going to be a one size fits all solution, um, but we, uh, we, we just sort of keep uh, nipping at it, trying to, to make it better. Um, I will, you know, you know, we have, I am happy to stick around for another 20, 30 minutes um, and we can continue the, the conversation. There's a few other comments and topics that we can discuss, but if anybody uh, wants to leave, um, we can do that. Charles, before that, do you have anything you want to close off with? Um, I had no idea how this was going to go and it was, it was great and, and you know, uh, um, never enough time and never enough opportunity to get to all the questions. Thank you, panel. Thank you, Eric, for, for tackling this. Thanks for everyone that offered questions. We have a couple of low hanging fruits and some higher hanging fruit that we can work on that have come up in this conversation. I would encourage everyone to use that Google form that Eric shared um, for anonymous um, comments. Um, you can use that or email us with ideas of things. We talked about um, some best practice documents and those sorts of things, you know, and, and starting to advocate on behalf of our membership to funding institutions, all doable. Um, just keep sharing ideas and we will we'll work on the things that, that, that make the most sense. Um, and if you volunteer an idea, we're probably going to call on you to help. So just fair warning. Um, so thank you, everyone. Be safe. Um, happy holidays to all of you that will be celebrating holidays in the next couple of months. Um, and take care of yourselves. And I'm happy to uh, stick around for until the, the hour if there's uh, other comments or questions that we, we want to hash out. But Thank you again to everybody and, and for those of us that uh, leave, have a, a good evening, good weekend. Yeah. And thanks everybody for welcoming a bird person mm -hmm. to this discussion. It's been a thanks, lot of fun. Arlen. We love birds. <laughs> I think it speaks really highly of your, of your all society that you're able to have these kind of conversations. I wish some of my professional societies were willing to engage with their membership this way, so. Big, big props to all of you. Um, I have I have been sitting, I'm not gonna suck up all the air in the room, Eric, don't worry, but um, I'm, I'm following your rules. Um, I, I've been sitting silent because obviously this is a conversation for everyone and I just have so many questions and, and so many good hard points um, that were raised. Um, but Ariel, we, you were talking about sort of with your group going and advocating, you know, to, to um, these other, uh, funding institutions. And this is going to, I am in my late 40s, um, have been a career scientist. I should know this answer. Why has this reluctance um, to fund stipends? It's it's so institutionalized. It's so, you know, it's Everywhere. the norm and not yeah. the exception. Um, you know, even when we talked about our small grants and native research, you still kind of get that, well, that's what we decided to do. And there was, it was, um, we'd have to go back into our, you know, written archives in boxes in the Smithsonian to, to answer the question potentially, but why, why does that exist? Do you have reasons? Uh, the, the reason that I've been given, so Wilson Ornithological Society, I, I just rotated off being on their council. We just changed our small grants program as well to allow it to pay people. And, and the hill that I had to fight up to make that change was people were being like, well, if you pay people, less science gets done because it eats up the budget. That was, that was the entire argument against the change. And I was like, well, if there are no people, who's doing the science? <laughs> um, you know, like, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's, somebody's gotta be there to collect the data or at least to pick up the device that's collecting the data, right? So. Um, that, that's been the primary justification that I've been given for those restrictions is that someone feels that less science will happen if we're spending that money on people versus other things. I'm sure there are other reasons for other places, but. Um, so we're, now that we're a slightly smaller group, 
um, we're going to open up one more avenue. Um, on Zoom, if you raise your hand, if you want to ask a question um, verbally or vocally, auditorially, um, Katarina will um, identify you and unmute you. Um, so we'll give that a shot until we've uh, reached some lull and I'll keep scrolling and see if there's other questions that have come through that we haven't addressed. And, and I do want to, um, knowing that we, we wrangled this uh, wonderful panel in with multiple people on the East Coast and others that are in far flung lands who may have to be getting on with their regular job. Um, so if people need to, to get off, um, please don't hesitate. We thank you for your, um, your service and time to this. Um, so don't, don't feel like you're being held to this. Um, just know that there will be some follow-up after this, I think, you know, with, with tackling some of these larger remaining questions, so. Um, and keep in mind, this is being recorded and will be posted so you can uh, catch up later as well. Yeah. Um, one thing that, that came up that, uh, I think since we have Charles on the line, um, now, it's, it, I think it would be nice to discuss a little bit more deeply the, the role of the society. Um, you know, we've, we talked early on that we can't solve all the problems. We've got um, limited resources uh, and there's been requests for the society to do a number of things. And, and this, you know, can, and don't want to um, divert this uh, from just this, this issue but um, I think it's worthwhile to kind of, yeah, think through or, or talk about, um, you know, Charles, how you see the, you know, more, I see the role of the society in addressing this question. Yeah, so, so I think um, there are, we'll call them the policy side of things that I think we can, we can start working on relatively quickly that, that, don't, that don't have an associated cost, but will have some, some greater benefit, you know, I think, the education and the empowerment. Um, I, I can't tell you how, and I've thought about it before, but every time it comes up, it makes me nervous. This discussion about um, how unprotected some unpaid positions can be, and and that if something goes wrong, the the implications of that um, can last a lifetime in in trying to get out of medical debt or other things. And again, that's not universal, but it's. Um, and you know that there are a few options to turn to should you find yourself in that in that sort of position. And so, I think that that is something. And and similar things like that are are. I I did do unpaid internships. I had a lot of privilege to be able to do those. Um, I never thought about that sort of side of the personal welfare. Um, and I don't know how many um, these early career scientists are are small, far wiser. Um, for the most part than I was at that same age. Um, and, and I don't know if they're doing similar calculus, but I, I, I was fairly naive. And so I do think pulling resources and considerations um, in a common place for, for our early career scientists to, to look at and have access to is gonna be important. Um, I do think um, clarification of definitions and coming up with some of these best practices, you know, I, I would love that we get to the utopia where everyone is is paid and 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 I in fact I don't want to use the word utopia I apologize that's that's almost uh, can be construed as as dismissive but um, there is going to be if we ever achieve that there's a transition period and and so I do think um, getting things that help students assess the quality of an opportunity you know knowing that they should be looking for or asking for you know can it be um, you know, travel costs, can there be some small stipend, housing, food, what are the things that come with it? And, and what is, what is the experience that I'm guaranteed, you know, Colleen Reichmuth brought up in the position, or in, in the comments, um, a lot of great comments, but one of them was talking about sort of the importance of the quality of the experience or alluded to the quality of the experience of, of her students and interns. And I don't think that's universal. Um, I do think that there is, uh, someone mentioned the cog in the machine kind of mentality that some you know, interns come in, they, they perform a process and they leave. And, and so I, I think the trade-off is we need to maybe as a best practice ensure that 
that these unpaid positions are maximizing the benefit for them, that they are coming out with an incredibly, if, if they're going to be in debt or if they're going to be, and this doesn't get to the disadvantage of, you know, the, that, um, that don't even make it in the door, um, but that there is some sort of maximum benefit. Are we, are we providing something that's of real value to the person, not just to the institution? On the bigger picture, and, and I'll stop um, in, in just a minute, one of the common threads that came through, and this is a more um, financial burden to the society, um, is the paying internships. And I commented in the chat, so people might have seen it, is, is coming up with scholarships to, to create opportunity and the society paying for them. So we are, uh, we don't have beneficent benefactors that are, are you know, throwing money at us. Um, and so we work on a fairly tight budget. We have savings and, and those sorts of things, but that is to deal with adversity and, and you know, make sure we survive from one conference to the next. Um, so I think there's the opportunity that we could provide greater funding and support. Um, our impact would be relatively small. Um, and it would also be a conversation that would happen to have, have to happen with this, the broader membership of the society um, because it's your fees and your dues to being a member that, that pay for this. And so I think it's getting to that um, uh, uh, strategic planning and what, what, what does our membership want us to focus on? Um, but um, I, I would love to do more support. Um, it's just, it's a zero sum game right now financially. And that's not an excuse. Uh, we could divert all of our resources to that and forego some other things if, if that's where we as a community felt was the way to go. Thanks, Charles. I think that's, that's good to have for people to have in, in their heads um, because I can see that's uh, you know, going to weave into more discussions and it would be nice to have, um, I think more interactions between the membership and the society in that strategic planning, so we can, you know, hear those voices and, and have a sense of, you know, the directions that, that we want to go in, and how important some issues are relative to others. So that that sort of waiting has to happen. Um, we've, uh, let's see, we I think we have uh, Sally Mizrock on uh, unmuted for a question. Yeah. Hi. Um, um... First of all, um, I was lucky uh, to have never had to have an unpaid internship. I was hired on very soft money for about nine years at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center with uncertainty every fiscal year until I got a full-time permanent. You know, And I spent, what, 38, 39 years working for the fisheries service. Um, over the course of that time, I had a number of interns. Most of them were work study students. So my center paid half their salary. It was through the university. I did have uh, volunteers walk in the door and many of them ended up staying long enough that we were able to find contract money for them. And so they eventually did get paid. The thing that people have mentioned periodically through this conversation is one of the, but not as a keystone, is what about the people who couldn't have walked in my door? What about the people who couldn't have knocked on my door at the center and spent some time volunteering? And, and I know people are aware of it, but the, the, the peop, the, my issue is that we have a lack of diversity. When I think of the volunteers and the interns I had, they were from a certain socioeconomic class. And I, I, the hidden loss of those, those young people who couldn't walk in the door because they couldn't afford to take X number of hours a week and hang out with me and, and do work. I agree fully that when we have these young people, they need to have interesting work. I tried very hard to not assign them scut work, but I just wanted to, to remind myself and remind everybody, the hidden people, the people we do not see, the people who did not come, weren't able to come knock on my door and volunteer for me. And so I just, I, I know, I think Eric feels similar, similarly about this. I just wanted to mention it again. And it's a very tough nut to crack and I don't have an answer. So there you go. Yeah, thanks for that, Sally. And I mean, I, I've avoided sort of in during this uh, saying, you know, taking a, a personal stance or, or giving a, an opinion and, and um, I, I, I do truly see both sides of this issue, but 
um, as Sally alluded, yeah, my experience is, uh, is somewhat similar. I, I, like most of the people here, am lucky in that I got into the field starting with uh, an unpaid, you know, a volunteer position. Um, but I, I had friends and, and people I knew growing up who um, I could kind of see on parallel tracks and was aware that, that they um, were going down you know, a different path because they didn't have um, some of the resources I had to be able to take that position. Um, and, and they saw me as being lucky and I you know, saw myself as, as being um, lucky. And, and, uh, you know, it, and it's been, it been difficult um, in various stages to kind of go down this career path and not seeing somebody that looks like me. Um, and so there's, and just to inject, there's a, a, a flip side to that. Um, if this, uh, you know, if we, we see this as being something that closes doors, um, it means that, that the, the few of, of any socioeconomic class or, or any um, sort of underrepresented group that make it through um, end up with, uh, a, 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 you, know, you know, serious imposter syndrome. They end up, you know, often being, being tokenized. Um, it, and I think we can, uh, you know, it's, it's easy to see how, how that, um, you know, enhances the, uh, the, the disparity um, between, between different groups. Um, so it's, it's just another side of it that that unseen group um, kind of, uh, you know, highlights the, the sort of their representatives that are already in the field and um, it, makes you, it makes you stand out more. Um, so there's, you know, there, there's, there's kind of multiple sides to that. And I, I think it's in just important, as Hallie said, to, to you know, and, and RAL and, and other people mentioned, just to keep in mind um, that, that survivor bias um, as, as we you know, continue talking about this. Um, do we have anybody else uh, on the line that would like to ask a question or make a comment? A few more minutes we can do. Hi, uh, it's, it's Cindy here. So, and I saw uh, one, uh, what's this chat? from a friend in the Philippines, um, uh, Jom from Baliena. So she said that, you know, we call for volunteers every season and we get inqu inquiries for people who cannot afford to pay. Um, so we pull money from those who can pay to volunteer to cover expenses of one or two who cannot. So this is something which uh, maybe uh, I, 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 I touched about on my presentation, but maybe it was not um, so clear. So I, I always, uh, you know, tell people that doing research in Asia, um, uh, it, it can be, uh, how to say, like it may be cheaper, for example, to run a boat survey in, uh, in Asia uh, compared to in uh, North America, because, you know, our fuels, uh, it may be cheaper, rentals cheaper, and, and everything is, is, is slightly cheaper. Uh, but then, um, you know, we'll also find time when we cannot afford to pay, um, you know, this boat and, and, and so, uh, local students. But when we get, um, you know, inquiry from uh, someone who's uh, you know, more privileged or uh, an international person who uh, is willing to pay and, they, and what they pay uh, can in turn support local students, one or two local students. So, you know, shouldn't we, um, you know, take that opportunity um, to educate local people whom we want to take up this uh, conservation and also science and, 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 and bring them into the fall and, you know, let them em empower them and let them have you know, like a say in, in what's um, in their background or, you know, their river and, and their seas and stuff like that. So that's why I feel like this is something that has to be, has to be mentioned. Um, it's not that just because of principle, you know, we, we, oh, we cannot accept pay, pay to play or we cannot accept a, a paid position because, you know, by principle. So it's, it's, not, it's not always that straightforward. It's very, very difficult. So it's either do you do the science with um, with the support from people who can pay, or you just don't do the science at all, and then uh, the international person uh, you know who wanted to volunteer uh, do not have the uh, experience, and the local people um, 
uh, you know, does not benefit from, from that. So that's why uh, I feel that um, this is, uh, but we are always very uh, straightforward. And then, you know, we'll always say that, okay, we cannot pay you, but, you know, we'll try to find a way to fund you or, uh, you know, the schools or the universities. And I feel that that's just something that um, if, if uh, more people know and uh, is aware of, then, then probably uh, they'll be, they'll be uh, more supportive of, 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 of the, the, the situation. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Cindy. That's uh, a really good point. And yeah, one that's been raised in other places that um, we, we definitely need to make sure we have community support and, uh, and, and that clearly overlaps with uh, the issue we've been discussing. It's a very good point. Uh, I think we have a question from Leslie New or a comment. Uh, yes, thank you. I was going to comment that I guess to me, there's multiple sides to this clearly. And one of them that we've really been focusing on is the need to ensure that people receive ex the experience and hopefully the funding and support that they need in multiple different ways, but also the, the reasoning behind why many people go for these experiences is to get the experience that they feel they need to get into the graduate program or the master's program or the undergraduate or the job. And so another way we can potentially look at it that we have more control over is how do we define what we are looking for in these candidates, right? If we're closing doors to people by not paying them experience, jobs that give them the experience, then can we say, okay, instead of putting out an advertisement for a technician that requires five years experience, are we willing to train someone on the job? And, and really look, because that's something that we can control individually. It's not dependent on the system. And that may be, I don't know what the answer is or how we address it, but that's another way to make these experiences that people can go out and volunteer for valuable, but then also remember when we're looking that it's not all that there is. So um, thanks for that, Leslie. And I just want to jump in. Everybody's kind of talked about their personal experiences and, and stuff. And so in, in, my, in my division in, out here in Hawaii at NOAA, it's, we're having a lot of conversations about that and, and changing. This is you know, slightly tangential to this overall topic, but it's, it's, it is part of that pipeline feeding into you know, careers and stuff. And I think one of the things that we also, in a broader context, need to change is um, there's so much competition and there's so much, uh, and there's so limited time and there's pressing conservation needs. There's, a, you know, everything is bigger, faster, better, more now. Um, and we hire with that mentality. And so um, one of the doors that's closed is if there's a lack of opportunities because people can't take um, unpaid positions, we hire quite often, not at, 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 this is speaking of our own culture in, in my shop, hired for the person that was gonna be able to hit the ground running. So it is those people that benefited from all these previous experiences where the door might've been closed to others. Um, and we are, we are working hard to stretch some new muscles and to really think about um, the fact that we are gonna commit ourselves to investing more time in that mentoring. So changing our definition of what the best candidate is. And it's not about product oriented, that will come with time. It is who's gonna be a good fit, who's gonna diversify perspectives, who's going to uh, help our program be more reflective of the communities that we serve in our Pacific Islands region and, and things like that. Um, and I just feel that, that, you know, that there's so many of these subconscious decisions that we're making every day um, with good intent, always with good intent that, that build these additional barriers. So it gets back to, it came up multiple times in this conversation is, there's so many parts of this pipeline that need addressing. Unpaid internships are one of them, but everything that comes before, you know, how you get people in these underrepresented communities to recognize themselves when they're going through an education system, that these are career opportunities for them. You know, it's just, there's so much. It's um, overwhelming, but fixable. Yeah, and I, I think it's exciting too, Leslie, that you you found a way to identify the small things that we can find ways to 
implement more equitable things in our own workplaces. Like none of us can completely fix this system or even completely fix our own organization structure, but there are ways to think creatively and, and find ways to do things a little bit more equitably, which I think is really exciting. Yeah, Aria, thanks. And, and to sort of uh, add to, to both Charles and Ariel's comment, um, I, you know, I, I, I just wanted to put out there that we, we shouldn't feel the, the weight of the, the large problems um, and such that they crush us into thinking that it's unsolvable. Um, I, as I, I came into this position at, in, for the Diversity Inclusion Committee with um, you know, no experience in this space at all. And, and one of the things that quickly uh, saw was that everybody has kind of a, a, what, um, and, and a facet that they think is the most important um, thing to deal with. And um, everything is important. And, and I, I think every little bit that we can bite off makes a difference and sort of compounds over time. Um, so just as in a, in a general, um, in a general statement for you know things like this, even though we, we don't um, you know make sweeping changes, um, just getting people to think about the effects and to think about um, and and make small changes to you know their the the way they do business um, actually may, I think makes a huge change um, if we you know if 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 as as it sort of just perpetuates the society. So all I say is is um, I just you know, offer a word of caution to not uh, you know, feel like because we're not taking big bites out of things doesn't mean that we're not actually eating it. Um, are there any other questions? Or I think we uh, had some really good discussions. Um, again, I just, if there's nothing else, I don't see anything pressing. We do have recordings. Um, obviously, the, the, um, the session's been recorded. Uh, we have uh, copies of the Q&A in the chat. And then we have the, um, the, the responses in the Google form. Uh, so we can continue to um, sort of put these together and, and address these. Um, and in some cases, uh, you know, we might um, post, I think, I think it would be good to have a summary of this and some of the issues that have come up and uh, address some of the comments and, and then continue this, this conversation. Um, as I said, our emails are available on the website, uh, both Charles is the president and uh, diversity at um, remammalscience.org. And uh, the, the uh, forum, it will just stay live uh, for you know, foreseeable future until we see no more entries. So feel free to continue that. And um, I just want to, again, one more time, thank everybody for participating and uh, for uh, I think, you know, really opening up and having a, a very good dis and, and useful discussion. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Eric. Um, take care all. And uh, this is the awkward moment of waiting for everyone to, to log out. <laughs> Have a good one, everyone. Thank you, Ariel. Everybody Thank have you, a good Cindy. weekend. Good holidays. Bye-bye. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.